Ready? Yep. Hi, I'm Brittany. And I'm Ashlyn. And, and we, we are, are the Ignited, Ignited Podcast. Podcast. <laughs> where educators come to feel remoralized. And they leave feeling re-energized. Today, we are talking about, what chapter is it? Cutting the interest rate. Chapter five. Of yes. The rewards. So in our typical book club fashion, it's time for our mostly coherent, slightly chaotic time summary. Two minutes, that's, right? That's also another really great t-shirt that we should have, Brittany. Mostly coherent, somewhat chaotic. chaotic. Oh, I, li- I like that one. That one's a good one. Should- I'm going to write that down. Yeah. I like We're going to have like a whole series. Uh, series of Ignited merch that we will release at some point in time oh gosh. of all these sayings. I think we should really invest in like mugs. Yes. Yeah. Or if we have um like the cups for water too, because I just ha- I always have my oh, drink yeah, yeah, right yeah. here, and then we can hold it up. Yes. Somewhat. Co- wait, wait, wait. What'd you say? Somewhat coherent. Mostly coherent. Yes. Slightly chaotic or something gosh. like that. I like slightly chaotic. Oh gosh, these are gold <laughs> nuggets. Okay, mostly coherent. All right, let's do this. Two minutes. All right, you ready? You ready? Yeah, I'm. Um, I gotta get my timer up. Boo boo boo. Ooh. Okay. To see, it was all ready to go. Let me know. I'm ready. All right. Ooh, ooh, it started. It started. All right. So, in chapter five of Punished by Rewards, the chapter is called "Cutting the Interest Rate." And in this chapter, Alfie Cohn talks about the fifth reason why rewards fail. And this whole chapter ends up impacting how rewards change the way people feel about what they do. So the two primary ways that rewards change how you feel is that they make something that was once internal feel like it is now a prerequisite to do something. And it also takes away your autonomy. So those are the two big concepts that Cohn ends up unpacking in this chapter. And throughout the course of the chapter, he also addresses things that the skeptics might say. So if they're like, well, you know, rewards should still be used. Like they're not that bad. They could be fine. These are the reasons why they are not. So um, the excuses people might give are that, well, having two kinds of motivation in kids, like intrinsic and extrinsic, that's better than one. And he's like, no, but that's not the case. People also could say that it's not bad if rewards are not permanent and we can take them away. And Alfie Cohn dismisses that too. Or how people want goodies, let's reward them. Or let people reward themselves. Or what if we incentivize the right thing? Or what if the thing that we're trying to reward is just boring so kids won't want to do it anyways? He ends up unpacking all of these excuses throughout the chapter and then ends by talking about, well, if you have to use rewards, this is how you should do it, but really try not to use rewards. Um, And then he kind of ends with two bombs at the end of the chapter about how, I feel like they were bombs, about how schools should get rid of award ceremonies and banquets and that there could be a mental health connection between rewards and just how people feel. Boom. Yes, that was great. Awesome. Wait. Yes. Okay, cancel. There we go. Dope. Oh man. Right. Okay, so it's been yeah, it's been it's been a little bit since I read this chapter. So, okay. Um, on your mark, get set, go. Okay, so cutting the interest rate, it really goes. It dives into like the big um emphasis of why rewards fail mainly because it um kills all motivation to keep doing the um to keep doing the the thing that people are being rewarded for um such and it also covers uh like deadlines um where the deadline um, increases stress levels and will um, make it so that people are no longer as motivated as if the um, it was an open-ended type assignment. 
Um, let's see. Let me look. I got to look at my notes. Um, so it goes on to Ryan and Desi's self-determination theory. He dives into um, autonomy and how reward giving rewards um, really kills a person's sense of um, their feeling of control because the reward is now controlling them and that lack of autonomy, which is in, which is needed for intrinsic motivation is completely like removed. And that is how rewards kill intrinsic motivation and makes the, in our case, students re rely on ex more extrinsic rewards. Um, so rewarding begets rewarding. Um, it goes into the um, the like Pizza's Hut, uh, Pizza Hut's uh, read or read it, I think it was called book it, and that uh, three seconds. Oh, geez, when you have um, when you're rewarding kids for reading, they you you shouldn't want that. You shouldn't reward them for reading because then it makes them not want to read. Oh my god, that was terrible. <laughs> I think that you still pulled out some really great things, and that's not bad uh, for having read this chapter a few weeks ago. Brittany yeah. did this. She read ahead. Yeah. I, I forgot we were doing the summary. Oh, man. That was – oh, gosh. Uh, Ash, you always have my back, though. Thank you. Of She's course. So supportive. You know, I, I mean, I did just boo you in the middle of our live, but besides <laughs> that – all support, all yeah. love from this side of the internet over here. Man. Okay. So in this episode, here's the outline that Brittany and I have prepared for you. We're going to start off by talking about our own experience with losing internal motivation and then talk about exactly how rewards kill intrinsic motivation, the things that suck <laughs> about extrinsic rewards, mm -hmm. the excuses people have for why they want to keep going with them, and then what Alfie says about, well, if you got to use rewards, this is what you should do. And I want us to touch upon, too, those bombs that were dropped, like the last few paragraphs of the chapter about no awards and banquets for schools and the mental health connection between rewards and your mental health. So that's the outline. And, of course, we'll also have some action tips for you guys based on our reading today. And uh, let's dive into this, Brittany. I'm yes. excited to hear, especially because you're an artistic person. Mm, I know. What? And you, what your experience has been with losing internal motivation once you're given an extrinsic reward. Have you had something like that? Um, yeah, specifically with like deadlines. Mm -hmm. um, when a deadline is put on a project, it really, it almost brings out the procrastination in me. Like the stress. Mm. Yeah. And so, and I, he mentions that too in this chapter that for people who are neurodivergent, it can become so stressful that they end up procrastinating and then they need to, uh, they end up like pulling an all nighter and it decreases, majorly decreases the quality of the work. And I think that like art school, it's a big one. And if it's really interesting if you consider adding like grades mm -hmm. because grades are, I mean, known to um, impact the quality of work. So when you add deadlines and you add grades, you're really not getting the um, the quality of like open ended creativity where you're just like creating for the enjoy of creation. Um yeah, so I think that was something that really stood out to me. Uh, in not only in this chapter, but because he's covered this throughout the book, like everything that we've read so far. Yeah, I feel all of that. And I was also thinking too that you might find some parallels. I'd be interested to see if you do with content creation as well. Mm. Because I listen to podcasts about like content creators and burnout that you feel because you're artistic and you're making all of this stuff, but then you kind of put yourself into a schedule where like you mm -hmm. have to post this many times and it can be really stressful. Mm -hmm. um, so I've kind of, I don't know, I guess I could say intrinsic motivation has died down periodically, but then mm -hmm. I'll take like a bit of a hiatus from social media and then I'll be right back. Mm -hmm. I feel like it's never the ideas. Like I still love the act of doing and writing and having the ideas. Yeah. I feel like it's more the logistical end that drives me crazy. 
Oh my gosh. Like yeah. it's not the writing of the story because a lot of my posts are like B-roll footage and I tell a story on top. Mm -hmm. It's not the stories. It's mm -hmm. more of like the cutting and pasting from my notes into Instagram, finding the sound that matches. Yeah. Then Instagram deletes all my edits and I have to do that three times because that's just how it works sometimes, you know. That's the stuff that really gets me like yeah. the monotony yeah. of it. The back end stuff really mm -hmm. like – uh, the product I mean the production the production the filming like you said the writing it's all a lot of fun I would say the same thing but um yeah the like the writing everything putting the text on mm -hmm. um it's yeah it or like messing you mess one thing up and then you have to start all over <laughs> but yep. I think what kills my creativity the most is like the the feeling like I have to put it out mm -hmm. because like I'm riding a wave of either views or you know I um there's this pressure like to maintain um oh what's the word um consistency yeah, yeah consistency and people like investing their time you mm -hmm. know like interacting so because that's how the algorithm the algorithm yeah. works like if you stop posting then it's not going to put it's not going to make your stuff visible so yeah i but i mean it's it's the way of the world right so how do we you know how yeah. do we get away from that like and that's uh, one of the things i was thinking too like it, it is hard especially when we get down to the end of the podcast when we start talking about no awards and things like that mm -hmm. because it is kind of the way of the world, you know, mm -hmm. like if you stop awarding kids, well, kids need like awards for their applications for college and things like that. Mm -hmm. You have to list things that you've done. So it gets tricky. It gets kind of blurry. Um, something I wanted to mention before we even talk about exactly how rewards kill intrinsic motivation mm -hmm. is that story that um, was mentioned in this chapter about the yeah. old man who was insulted. Mm -hmm. Remember that one, Brittany? Mm -hmm. So just to paraphrase, the premise of this is that this old man would be outside and then every day these kids would come by and just insult him and like make all these jabs and insults. Just terrible. I know, right? And then they call him like bald. Yeah, like, something like that. Like <laughs> and so then the story goes that the man said, hey, tomorrow, whoever can give me the best insult or something will have a dollar. So mm. the kids come by, give their best insults. I forget if it was like every kid who insults him. Gets a dollar. Yeah. Every kid who insults yeah. him gets a dollar. Yep. Um, and then he was like, all right. So tomorrow, every kid that comes by will get like 25 cents, I think it was. Was it 25 cents? Yeah. Like because he decreases the amount and the kids are like, wait, what? Yeah. Yep. So it's 25 cents. And the kids were like, all right, well, we'll still go for it. And then they come back, insult him. Then the following day, he's like, all right. So I can only give you a penny now for your mm -hmm. insults. And the kids were like, ah, it's not worth it. And they left them alone. Yeah. <laughs> and I can see the way that thought process goes. Yeah. And it's crazy because we incentivize so many things in school. Yeah. So how – you want us to share something, Britt? Um, no, other than like I see that in my kids – that you have to keep increasing their the rewards, especially if you use a token economy. Like what they do for like, uh, we call them panther paws. What they do for five paws, the five paws become ineffective, and then you've got to start increasing it to ten. You know, and it's the same stuff. Yeah. I don't use I don't use that anymore, but. It definitely is super obvious, and I guarantee other people who have token economies can will say the same thing. Is it? Are you not using them with all of your classes now? Because now you're doing mm -hmm. the experiment. Oh, you got rid of it for all of them. Yeah, um, I'm still doing. You know, I call it class dojo, but it's not class dojo. It's it is a group based reward. Um, I'm still doing that with a few of my classes, but the class that I took away. PBIS for that was really interesting because um, we got to the point where they were doing they're doing self reflections and the sheet ran out because I was only going to do it for three weeks and I saw that the sheet ran out and I'm like oh well then you know like this would be the end of the system like I'd go back um, to PBIS because this was just I was testing it out mm -hmm. and I talked to them about it and 
a couple of the kids wanted to go back. So I'm like, okay, well, why do you want to go back? And it was because the kids that were really um, distracting, they felt like they weren't, they, f the kids that wanted to get rid of the new system and go back to PBIS felt like the kids that were cutting up weren't being consequenced because I removed those points. Mm. And so they felt like everybody was receiving the same, um, the same treatment, even though th like they were being good and the others were being, you know, not making good choices. Um, and I thought that was really interesting because that it, um, it like makes the kids feel like they're getting revenge, like revenge almost. Vindicated on the kids. almost. Yeah. Yeah. Like, so I did have to address that. And, um, I did my, we've talked about this before where like, okay, well the, the kids that are cutting up, they have to review expectations during their lunch and recess. Cause that's the only time I have available. So I think the, the kids, um, that were being, um, God, I can't, I want to say well-behaved, but that's mm -hmm. poor language. I don't want to use that. Um, the kids that were doing what I needed them to do, they felt better when they found out that those kids that were cutting up were going to like have to be in for their recess. Mm -hmm. But that was the only, that was the only th reason why they wanted to go back to the old system. And that makes sense too, given the research that we've been doing in this chapter, yeah. because it instills a kind of competitiveness, mm -hmm. you know? And mm -hmm. because we have this false dichotomy of, well, you're either punished or you get away with it. Yeah. Um, yep. And truthfully, like even like getting away with it in air quotes, I'm putting mm -hmm. it in. I feel like you don't get away with anything because the behaviors that you have become the habits that you build. And that becomes the kind mm -hmm. of person that you are. Yeah. So, okay, sure. Maybe you get away with calling somebody names, but how's it going to affect you in life? If when you feel triggered, you insult people, right? What are you going to get away with? Like, how yeah. is that going to affect your relationships and your family and your friendships? Yeah, that's just, that's a difficult conversation to have with one younger kids. Yeah. Um, and concrete thinkers. Mm -hmm. Like I was talking to you about a student of mine that has ASD and it's really hard to to be abstract like that. Like, well, in the future, when you have relationships and they like they can't escape the um what is being done to me right now, you know? Mm. Yeah, that's true. But yeah, it's I think it's interesting and it's going I I think it's going really well and I plan on like phasing out PBIS in all of my rooms definitely next year. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah, I love I love that you're doing this experiment with us too. While we're doing the book club, mm -hmm. yeah. um, so now let's talk about how rewards exactly go about killing intrinsic motivation. And I have a quote from page seventy four mm -hmm. that kind of encapsulates a lot of that for the audience who maybe hasn't read along with us. Mm -hmm. So it says that. A single one-time reward for doing something you used to enjoy can kill your interest in it for weeks. So that one-time reward. It can have that effect on a long-term basis, in fact, even if it didn't seem to be controlling your behavior at the time you received it. The reward may also spill over to spoil your attitude about brand new activities. In effect, making you more dependent on extrinsic incentives generally. And just as you don't have to be the one smoking a cigarette, in order to be harmed by it, merely watching someone else get the reward for engaging in some activity can have at least a temporary motivation killing effect, end of quote, which is also very timely considering what you were just talking about mm -hmm. with the kids seeing PBIS and now not seeing it. Yeah. Yeah. Um, I highlighted that too. The merely mm -hmm. watching someone else get a reward for engaging in an activity can have at least a temporary motivation killing effect. Like that's... That's crazy to like embody that um, 
that experience that's happening to somebody else. Mm -hmm. And when you're in such a saturated environment, like a school that's really doing PBIS with fidelity, um, that's just so motivation killing. Because not only are you rewarding the student, but then they're witnessing another, you know, their peers being rewarded. Mm -hmm. And it's just like the entire basis of your existence as a student is to just get these tokens. Like, yeah. It's not to learn or to engage in, you know, like the curiosity and the creation, the creating. It's to be able to shop at the school store. Exactly. And that's a that whole Gatorade. <laughs> a Gatorade. Yeah. yeah. That's the whole prerequisite effect of how rewards make the task feel like a prerequisite. Hence oh, the yeah. decrease of intrinsic motivation. Because how often like how much care do you put into the prerequisite of something? Exactly. And then there was a um a quote from page 69 that kind of um goes into that. But intrinsic motivation remains a powerful predictor of how good a job someone will do in the workplace or how successfully he, oh, no, that wasn't it. But, I mean, that's true. Intrinsic motivation is a very good predictor of how good someone will perform, whether they're in the workplace or they'll they will learn in school. And I think that's across the board understood, right? Like everybody, if every teacher could build intrinsic motivation, of course we would. But it's so it seems so complicated you know i also feel like it's depicted to be so complicated because extrinsic rewards are painted as being so easy and simple mm -hmm. and they're so yeah. common you know yeah. the i don't know if it was in this chapter or for something else i was reading but the effort it takes to tell somebody well if you do this you'll earn that mm -hmm. is no more effort than to say you should try this instead or what if you did this? Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, I don't know if that was in this chapter or not, but the language is not super complicated. It's just a different thought process entirely. And mm -hmm. as a teacher, you kind of have to rewire your brain out of that, mm -hmm. which I'm sure you probably felt as you're going through the process of getting rid of rewards. Yeah. And it's really interesting because one, um, one of the students that I had today from that class um, in their like lunch detention I process all of my expectations with the student and what they did to be like reviewing expectations with me. And so I, uh, so I asked them, okay, why are we here? Or why are you here? What happened? What'd you do? Um, how did that affect others? And the student couldn't name it. Boom, boom, boom. And then like, I got into like the nitty gritty of the behavior. Like why, why is it happening? Mm -hmm. And is it anxiety? He's, he said, it's my ADHD. I'm like, okay, well you're making noises. Is that ADHD or is that anxiety? And he's like, well, it's, it's a little bit of both. And I'm like, well, how does it feel? He's like, well, it feels it during that time. It feels like somebody's staring at him and it's, it's during my 10 deep breaths. Mm -hmm. which everybody's quiet and we're taking 10 deep breaths together, which is, it's like a big trouble moment for um, kids with severe anxiety because a lot of them feel like, well, people are looking at me. So having that opportunity to pull him in, you know, instead of just taking his points, mm -hmm. like I got to, I got to the, the root of the problem. And then I was able to offer solutions like, okay, well, you know what? Put your hoodie up, put your head down. And he's like, well, then it hurts to breathe, too. And I'm like, well, then don't breathe with the video. Just chill. And he's like, okay. And he left that meeting, like, with actual solutions. Yeah. You and know? that's the thing, too. You know, you have to do that stuff or nothing's going to change. You're just going right. to be in the same cycle. Yep. Yeah, which wouldn't have happened if I would have just taken all of his points, mm -hmm. which is, like, pretty much the go-to consequence. For P the PBIS, you know? Yeah, exactly. Or not give points. Mm -hmm. mm. That's also the case in some schools. That's what it would be. Yeah. I'm not going to give you the points, but mm -hmm. it's the same thing. It is the same thing. Yeah. <laughs> like, um, I also wanted to hear about, especially with your background in self-determination theory, mm -hmm. about the lack of autonomy that happens with extrinsic rewards and how that's another factor of why they kill intrinsic motivation. 
Okay. So for self for self determination theory, you have to have three needs met: belonging, autonomy, and competency. Really, I want to say autonomy, belonging, and competency because that makes it easier to remember because you have A, B, C. Autonomy, belonging, and competency. Autonomy is how much control do you feel like you have over your choices and your future. When you're rewarding, you are completely taking away the student's feeling of control because one, you're putting a stipulation. If you do this, then you're going to get this. That is compliance based and you are kind of manip you're manipulating the behavior. You're manipulating the student to get them to do what you want them to do, which is the opposite of autonomy. So when you take away one of those three belongings, you compromise that those needs that need to be met for intrinsic motivation. And that's what he, that's what Cohn really got into was um, with Ryan and Desi in this chapter, who are the founders of self determination theory. Um, yeah, you have the prerequisite. Is that is that what you were um, is that what you were referring to? Was Ryan and Desi? I think that was the research that was referenced for that one. They were no, all over this chapter. Yeah. But no, autonomy is huge. Mm -hmm. And even just as an adult thinking about jobs I've had where I felt very micromanaged, like it kills everything. Yeah. And then we're surprised when we see that play out with students. Yeah. Yeah. I think we get far removed from what it feels like to be a child mm -hmm. and to feel that powerlessness. And then it kind of becomes like, well, I guess it's like project management or chaos management. It almost feels like we treat people as objects and that we need to run smoothly in order for our job to go well. Mm -hmm. But we don't work with inanimate objects. We work with humans. Right. And their days vary. Their emotions vary. Their experiences vary. They have trauma and lived experience just like us. Mm -hmm. So that need for autonomy to see them as a full person and who they are. That is paramount. Yeah. And that's also trauma informed practice, too, right? Right. Well, I'm interested. So, you practice conscious classroom management. And what does that say about autonomy? Sorry, I muted myself when you're oh, talking. Yeah. So, uh, try to give it, right? <laughs> like everything aligns with the research that we're doing. Try to give it and give the kids control and agency whenever they can. So like even right now in my classroom, we're working on partnerships and talking to the kids about, okay, I could very, like I can pick your partnerships, but I want you to pick somebody who you think you're going to work well with. And maybe it's your best friend, but maybe it's not. And that's okay. You want to be able to pick someone where your skills can shine through, their skills can shine through, and then you can create something you're proud of. So we've been going through this process now of being like, okay, Maybe it's not best if I work with my best friend because I might get just more distracted there. And then the kids realize then that and they're like, all right, how about we don't work together for this one? I still love you. You're still my bestie, but let's not work together. I'm going to do this with somebody else. Or they choose to work solo. But this is like gradual things I'm doing. And when I first started this, um, they were automatically like, oh, let's go pick our best friend. And so it's it's very easy when that happens to be like, all right, reel back everybody I'll assign everybody's partnership again because I want things to go smoothly. But then kids aren't going to learn how to pick somebody they work well with and manage those interpersonal skills and to know themselves too. So this has been the past couple of weeks that we've been doing it. I'm on break right now because we have February break in Massachusetts. But I already see it working well. And even the kids who at first, like my silliest kids who are more likely to get distracted, they're coming to me and they're like, yeah, you know, I think maybe I shouldn't work with this person too much on projects like this because it's just hard for me to focus. And I'm like, yeah, that's fine. Like, it's not a big deal. Like, I'm glad that you know yourself. But giving them the opportunity to know that for themselves and to come to that conclusion on their own, not be told by an adult, that's impactful for them. So I think that now that you mentioned that, that is one of the biggest things that I've seen in the class that I removed PBIS from, um, is that they're one, I'm, I, I am more comfortable with letting them fail. 
so mm-hmm. that they can learn. Yeah. Because I'm no longer prompting. So the natural consequence is really emphasized. If you sit there and you goof off, you're going to not get that studio time at the end of class that you really like enjoy. Mm-hmm. And you're going to end up like owing me time during your recess or your lunch because that's the time I have available. And so I don't prompt anymore. I just let that happen. And now they're starting to correct themselves. Mm -hmm. Like I see it in their face because I'll just stand there. I mean, I'm cool, right? Like I don't have to, you know, I can just stand here and wait. And as I stand there, they start looking at me and then they recognize what they're doing and they correct. They self-correct. Exactly. And then one of my favorite things I've been doing lately too is saying, so what's your plan going to be? Mm. So if you and Brittany are working on this and your goal was to be done through step six to then you're not done, what's your plan? Because tomorrow we start step seven. And they're like, I, I guess we'll do that home tonight. And I'm like, yeah, that'll work. Like you'll be called up. I wish you didn't have to have homework. Maybe tomorrow you could do something different. What could you do differently? Mm. But like putting the ball just repeatedly in their court, I feel like it's a lot of deflecting. <laughs> like yeah. I'm deflecting, taking their autonomy. It's like, nope, I'm not in charge. Take that. Nope, not yeah. in charge. You take that. And it ends up being like a lot of less, like a lot less work. Exactly. And a lot less pressure and stress. And then mm-hmm. it also takes away the power struggle. Yeah. Because I'm not trying to control you. I don't control you. You control yourself. What are you going to do about that? And I've had a lot of teachers um, – like message me about what they what they should be doing in um, their classroom with certain students. And mm-hmm. it seems like a lot of these kids would be identified as ODD, mm-hmm. which is oppositional defiant disorder. And PBIS does not work with ODD kids. No. In fact, the class that I took the the class that I took PBIS away from has students that I would ODD and yeah. those students are thriving yeah and I'm like oh yeah. and uh, conscious classroom management do. yeah <laughs> like in conscious classroom yeah. management it's just like that too like I've had students who in every other class they give the teacher a run from their money and it's mm-hmm. constant power struggle mm-hmm. but there's like there's no power struggle because I'm trying to give them power <laughs> yep yep exactly. yeah and, and everybody's like well you just let them you know do what they want and I'm, I'm like, well, it might look like that if you're passing my classroom and I'm just standing there while they talk, but they're going to get that natural consequence. I'm mm-hmm. just not going to stand there and be like, that's irresponsible. That's your, that's your responsible point. Mm-hmm. That's not safe. That's your safety point. Like, yeah. Or what I might know. say is like, Hey, and you might, it looks like you might need some support with this right now. Do you want mm-hmm. my help? Oh Yeah. And positioning that differently and not like Mm -hmm. I'm trying to control your every move. I'm here to help you succeed. So do you want my insight? Yeah. I'll say, um, do you like, do you need something from me? What can I do to help you? And there's another thing that I said. I actually said it today. Uh, I can't remember. I'll think of it. But yeah, if I say like those really um, commonly iterated phrases. Mm-hmm. Like, do you need help? It turns, it almost turns my students off. So I do try to rephrase it mm-hmm. so that it's just not like triggering. Yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Like, honestly, I don't know how often I say, do you need help? I feel like I do phrase it mm-hmm. a bit differently. Yeah, but you, you have to did. know your kids and mm-hmm. figure out like what they respond to. Like, mm-hmm. I know I have one student where if I audibly say anything about help, they're going to shut down. Yeah. But if I write on a sticky note, They'll circle mm-hmm. something. Oh, like, yeah, yes, please talk idea. to me in the hallway. But they want mm-hmm. to be very much under the table because they feel judged or they mm-hmm. feel very on alert with how people might think about them. Yeah, self conscious. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um. So then let's talk about some of the excuses then for why people would still want to stick with their rewards. Okay. I'm getting to those notes. So the first one was that well, having two rewards or two kinds of motivation is better than one. Yeah. Motivation must come from outside the individual. 
Mm-hmm. What page are you looking at? Um, but if we just that heading, it starts on page eighty-one. Okay. I see. I highlight so many things because it's just so everything's important. Okay. I know, right? Yeah. <laughs> Everything should be capitalized. Yeah. Okay. Um. So quite clear is that things don't always work this way in the real world. You can combine different forms of control to make people less motivated, but it's not so easy to combine ex- intrinsic and extrinsic motivation to make them more motivated. Exactly. That also yeah. just seems unnecessarily complex. Say that again. It seems unnecessarily complex. Yeah. Well, You're thinking too much yeah, about it. Exactly. Mm-hmm. If we have to spend that much effort, why don't we just meet the needs? Right. Exactly. I know. And it's it's really kind of crazy because um, recently I, I posted a video that's gotten a lot of views and people just think it's impossible. Like people, people don't think it's impossible. People either think that it needs to be highly funded. Like we can't meet needs unless you're buying expensive timers and stools and which I did post some um, pretty high end you know, items. Um, but you can meet needs just by using your body language as you speak, because then you're engaging those visual learners along with the auditory learners. And there's so many right? like, hacks around it too. I'm thinking, cause I'm thinking of the video that you posted, which you all should check out by the way, Brittany went viral last week, which is awesome. Yeah. Um, but she had a visual timer on her board. Mm-hmm. You could just project a timer on Google. Yes. That's counting down. Yes. Or she showed these wobble stools. Mm-hmm. Just have kids stand up. Yep. And move or around. Put a cushion underneath them. Yeah. Like they, a pillow it gets or something. The same. Yeah. Like, or it's vestibular. Oh, go. Um, <laughs> this I, I've come across on accident because it. this is just, I need to update things. Mm-hmm. But those little tennis balls, if you cut them, put them on the bottom mm-hmm. of a chair. Mm-hmm. If you put them on opposite legs, the kids can wobble. Oh, the cost yeah. of two tennis balls. Yeah. That's a good one. Well, you know, I come across that. I've come across that by accident because now my tennis balls are old, so they're falling off. So it looks like somebody's come to play tennis in my room and just like abandoned a few tennis balls every single day. That's hilarious. Um, But yeah, that's like an alternative option. And we're teachers. We're creative. Like there are ways that you can make things happen. Not. Okay. So I have a really good one that I just learned about. Mm -hmm. Um, You can go to a bicycle repair shop. And request old um, bicycle tubes, and you can tie them around the the legs of desks, and the kids can use those for like to rest their feet on, or to kick back and forth. I think I have exercise bands tied to mine, and the kids rest their feet on it, and then they can like press them. Yeah. Um. But it doesn't need to be an exercise band. Like, I just emailed the bicycle shop by my house, like, hey, can I get some tubes? And they were like, absolutely. Like, I'm, they're just going to throw them away. Yeah. Take old bicycle tubes and tie them. Like, there are just so many ways. We're creative to meet needs. And kids might be creative, too. Like, ask them. Mm-hmm. So this is what I got. What do you think we could do with it? Right. And then watch some of the stuff they come up with. I've been blown away by things. Like, even in my class. So I, I have my students start off my class periods every single day and they guide the class in a bell ringer in the morning which is going over a vocabulary word so we have our word of the day the kids all write down in their little journal and then we share the example non-example and say the word three times so it's this whole protocol the kids know it by heart and then one of my kids came to me who was leaving the class and they were like hey would it be okay if i change up the bell ringer a little bit to have it be more interactive and i was like absolutely and she was like do you want to know what I'm going to do? And I said, nope. Surprise me. Let's see what do you come it. up with. Mm-hmm. And she had the class standing up and acting out the word with her. <gasps> oh, that's beautiful. Exactly. So yeah. kids come up with great things. Just give them a chance. You're right. And not only that, like that's something that every teacher could do. Act out the word. Yeah. True. Because that's that's going to get your kinesthetic kids. Mm-hmm. The kids that have to move. Well, I mean, honestly, anybody It works for anybody, whether you're a kinesthetic learner or not. If you pair emotion with a word, then you're going to remember that word. Like I have kids that I had in um, lower L that are now in middle school 
that I did all of the ASL signs for all of the elements of art, mm -hmm. they can still tell you the elements to this day. Now, I mean, you're talking about four or five years later and they can do the movements with them. Yeah. I And, you know, me too. I haven't done it in a while, actually, but I could do all of the ASL movements with the elements. Yeah. I'm thinking of like the little games they used to play in the school bus. Like the clapping thing. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. You like with your hands. Yeah. Uh-huh. Like, I still remember, like, all these different movements that we would do. Mm -hmm. And, like, the chants. Exactly. Mm -hmm. I was the last time I said that. It's been probably decades yeah. <laughs> since I've even said that. But you remember it. Yeah. Which is cool. Yeah. It makes me think I should do, like, a, a dance that just gets mm -hmm. added on to. And we have a dance move for each word. Yep. That will be fun. The kids will hate me for doing that. They're going to love me secretly, but they're going to yeah. be like, we have to dance out the word. You, but I kind of enjoy it because it's funny. Yeah. But I won't tell you that. Right. I hate exactly. this. Okay. <laughs> yep. But then they come and they show you their dance moves at the end of class. Yep. Yep. Or they're talking about it at lunch. Exactly. Totally. Showing you their friends in the hallway. Uh-huh. It's awesome. I had that with the latitude and longitude dance. I had the kids make up their own dance move for latitude and longitude. It's like a quick little ending thing. Yeah. Some of the kids made the funniest things. They were like, latitude. <laughs> they were like yeah. shaking on the ground and longitude. Reverse order, but doing That's all cute. these moves. Yeah, they were funny. Um, so anyways, other excuses are that, well, um, the rewards are not bad if they aren't permanent. But they are because you're still changing the way people think and function. Yep. And is that the where the quote came from? Like, even if you get a reward, if you get one reward, it impacts mo people's motivation for a period of like three weeks. That is not where I got it from. But like this whole chapter is talking about this. Yeah. So um, I have I have a quote from this section. Mm hmm. Um, Richard de Charms realized that the truth is quite different. Giving someone an extrinsic reason for behaving in a certain way changes the whole event. It does not just add a reward. Yeah. The gestalt has been shifted. The perception of the task and of one's motives may no longer be what they were. So like it changes the entire perception of the task just exactly. by one reward. And even before that, the same paragraph, page 82, it says, second, the practice proceeds from a model of human behavior that assumes we can do something to an individual. And then once we have stopped doing it, mm. be assured that there is no lasting effect. Rather like moving a piece of furniture into someone's living room and then moving it out again without having changed the room itself. And that stuck with me because I still remember small things that my teachers have done over the years mm. that they probably didn't remember at all, but things that stuck with me. Yeah. And not necessarily for anything, just because like it stuck with me. I remembered that. And yeah. so who are we to say that that moment when we do something and stop is not the moment that sticks with somebody? Mm -hmm. You know, we have no idea. Right. And we're dealing with children. Yeah. Like it's things that seem non, what's the uh, kind of essential like just, you mm -hmm. know, things that you wouldn't think a lot about. Arbitrary. Arbitrary. Um, it's it's going to impact the child more because they've had fewer experiences. Their brains are developing at much faster paces. Things just seem bigger to them. Yeah. True. I know. What's that? Then chemistry brain. Chemical brain chemistry. Chemical brain chemistry. Yeah. Dr. Brittany back with Brittany 101. <laughs> a chemical brain chemistry, brain chemistry for us. <laughs> hey, I, th I thought I did a pretty solid job. I'm going to have to re-listen to that. I think you did. I think that you always do a pretty it's solid gonna, job. It's going to be on a mug. <laughs> That's our next t-shirt. We brain. do a, a yeah. pretty solid job. But like the qualifier is yeah. pretty solid. Like we're not going to go full job. solid there yet, but it's pretty solid. Right. Um, and then the other argument is that, oh. well, let people reward themselves. Yeah. So, yeah. like, they pick their rewards to give to themselves. So, you want to, do you want to read a quote? Oh, uh, sure. This one comes from page 84. In practice, many behaviorists have tried to devise a way by which people can be made to do what the controller wants 
while letting them pop M&Ms into their own mouths. That mm -hmm. is, allowing them to choose how or when to reward themselves. Notice, though, that the ultimate goal is still compliance, and the process is therefore no less likely to be experienced as controlling. I like it because, like, we have the same things highlighted. Yeah. <laughs> like it, you're still controlling people. It may have a different mm -hmm. kind of a different color bow on it, but it's still controlling. Yeah. Because yeah, it's still compliance. Yep. Uh, so I have it. It's in the next paragraph. Mm -hmm. Even when the objective isn't necessarily to conform to another person's demands, people can and presumably do pressure themselves in much the same way that they can be pressured by external events. And the results of controlling themselves in these ways are similar to the results of being externally controlled. Yep, we highlight the same exact thing, Brittany. Yes, yes. So I think that's really, that's really, really interesting because even when you have the autonomy to set the reward and the timeline, you're still putting this like, external pressure which is why like last episode i was talking about the chemistry of the brain right chemical brain chemistry <laughs> and i was chemical talking about brain chemistry yeah one. i know I, I was talking about how i think that giving rewards increases dopamine like um it you, similar to what you would see with somebody who has a gambling addiction like mm -hmm. They just need that increase. Yeah. Like it needs to get, it needs to be increased each time they participate. And it's increasing cortisol levels because of the stress. Like there's a stress response. So whether you're experiencing a, re a reward for another from another person or you're putting that stress on yourself, there's still the stress response. And that response is the same. And so you're going to have that stress response. Like it's going to be stressful exactly which is what also connects to what we started talking about with like our content creation and the schedule mm -hmm. that we put ourselves under oh yeah yeah you know, we are doing that still doing that to yourself to ourselves yeah and it's like i can't stop so yeah. <laughs> <laughs> did you, you see well then did you see my story i um i posted and it's uh this chick that's like drinking tea and then the caption is like Every, this is kind of morbid, but like every body on Mount Everest was um, a highly motivated person that wanted to climb it. Like, so every, that, I don't want to say that. I feel like that's really morbid, but it's true. Like that, like you can have all of these goals and really be motivated, mm -hmm. but you've got to like, just kind of chill out and, you know, let yourself enjoy the experience. Which I think is hard if you're putting all of this external pressure on you, you know? Yeah, that's true. That's good to hear, too. I know. I know. Reminder, <laughs> I should have sent that to you. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> truthfully, um, as somebody who creates content, I am not somebody who scrolls frequently. Oh, Hopefully yeah. the algorithm does not hear me. But yeah, I do yeah. not typically watch or scroll too much. I post in <sighs> yeah. DMs. I love people. I've really done a good job of curating my content. Yeah. Like I'm constantly learning. Mm -hmm. It's, but it's easy to get sucked into the wrong side. Oh, Instagram. yeah. Or just get sucked into being on your phone for a long time. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Especially like I'm going through an ADHD flare up right now. Mm -hmm. And it's really hard because that is like, it's addicting. For people with ADHD, like it is addict, like just that scrolling mm -hmm. with like the visuals. Yeah, it's it's hard. That's my um, piece of advice. If you have ADHD, get off your phone. Yep. Good advice, <laughs> it's it's terrible. Everybody too, honestly. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> we say as we are broadcasting onto somebody's phone right now. Yeah, I know. You can, you but can you're not the end of the episode. <laughs> True. Yeah, True. you're not scrolling. This is um, educational. That's true. Yeah. Um, so then the other excuses are to incentivize the right thing. So instead of putting the emphasis on do X to get Y, in 
incentivizing the outcome that you want to have. Wait, what? <laughs> isn't that <laughs> isn't that just like incentivizing? So yeah, but you know how it was like with the pizza campaign. If you read a book, you mm-hmm. get a pizza. It's more yeah. like if you eat a pizza, you'll get a book. Oh, yeah, 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 yeah. So it's flip-flopping them. Right, right. So that's also not very effective, and your time would be better spent <laughs> just supporting people. <laughs> right. Just by giving a book. So I think that was actually um, that was actually pretty powerful because especially with Book It, you did mm-hmm. see a lot of kids, which we I talked about last episode, a lot of the kids were choosing like shorter text yeah. or easier text. And it's because they wanted to get the pizza. Mm-hmm. And it made like people's motivation for reading, which it, it reduced people's motivation, the kids in my class, definitely. Um, and it kind of like it made me lie oh I just lied I just said because I wanted to read the bigger books Mm -hmm. but I wasn't going to get as many points I wasn't going to get as many I think it was like marker or like a punch a hole punch yeah I mean it it impacts the quality of work which we've seen and then the other side of that coin is to reward how well somebody does something which the argument is coming from page 86 that says As Richard Ryan puts it, by making a goodie contingent on performance, not only do you control what I do, Mm -hmm. but you control how well I have to do it before you reward me. A situation more destructive of of autonomy and therefore of motivation than one where the reward is provided without reference to the quality of performance. Yeah. Well, I mean, making a goodie contingent on performance is incredibly subjective. Mm -hmm. Like who's determining what is good and what's, you know. Mm-hmm. what's not or even if it doesn't need to be good it just needs to be like mediocre hmm. and then the final excuse is well what if the thing is boring well i mean we've like the um the envelope licking example like mm-hmm. if it's a monotonous task then yeah, it's going to be effective. But the problem is, okay, so you give, you know, five tokens now, are you willing to give 10 tokens later? Mm -hmm. And then 20? Because that's what's going to be required. That's what's going to happen. They're going to, you know, it's not going to be as motivating unless you increase the reward. Yeah. And then the other thing too, is that we undermine like the creativity it can take to do something that's boring. So if you have to do something boring, well, how do you make it more engaging for yourself then? Oh, yeah. And that was something mentioned. And then they also gave us a formula by Desi on page 90 that, let me find it, says, first, oh. it's a three-pronged approach. Mm-hmm. First, imagine the way things look to the person doing the work and acknowledge candidly that it may not seem especially interesting. Second, offer a meaningful rationale for doing it anyways, pointing perhaps to the long-term benefits it offers or the way it contributes to some larger goal. Third, give the individual as much control as possible over as much control as possible over how the work gets done. Yeah. So that's Which the alternative. Increases creativity. Like, have you listened or heard any of the theories of why children should be bored? I've heard some stuff, yeah. Yeah, like that's that is pretty much what he's talking about here. Because when you're bored, your mind can wa- or your mind can wander. Mm-hmm. So it might be a super monotonous task, but it does give you it does give you an opportunity to let your mind wander and think creatively. Or like, yeah. you know, let's say that you have to do something that's really boring and you make it a game. Like that is a creative way to do a monotonous task. Exactly. Um, one thing I do want to add because Ryan and Dusty, when they define, um, competency, it's not just how well you can, I think it's in competency. It's, it might be in belonging, 
Um, but it, it's the sense of how much do you as an individual contribute to your community? Like how, um, how important do you feel your role is? And with yeah. this three pronged approach, it addresses that because when he says second offer a meaningful rationale for doing it anyway, pointing perhaps the long-term benefits it offers, like how does it help the people around you? How does it help the community? And that increases that sense of, I think it's actually, I think it's belonging, that sense of yeah. contribution, which increases intrinsic motivation because that's a part of their theory. Mm -hmm. No, everything connects. You know, it, it all does. comes full circle. And that's why I think it's so important that we're talking about this because it helps every aspect of mm -hmm. education. Um, and then the last excuse I think it may have said last excuse before this one, but this is the actual last, last excuse um, is that some people are just more extrinsically motivated than other people. So you oh. have to use rewards. And I've heard this before. Have you heard this before? I mean, yeah, because I think that if you would have taken the situation with my students that I removed PBIS for, mm -hmm. if you would have um, taken that situation at face value and you wouldn't have dig dug deeper, then it would have come off as like those kids need to be rewarded. They said that they wanted the PBIS system back mm -hmm. because, um, oh, what did he say? Like he was kind of beaten around the bush. Like I had so to kind like, of dig it out of him. Don't get away with stuff. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. But um, at face value, he said that he wanted the rewards back, right? Yeah. So I think when people are just asking students, one, it's what students are used to. It's all they know. It's they have the language to talk about it. Right. So it's very easy to say, well, kids want to be rewarded. Well, maybe they only want to be rewarded because that's the only system that they understand. And right? yeah, they've been exposed to. Mm -hmm. And that's one of the quotes, too, from page 91. Um, well, actually two things I want to share because mm -hmm. for those kids who it seems like they need this extrinsic motivation, um, Cohen points out, well, where did this disposition come from and what are our long-term goals for people, particularly children mm -hmm. with respect to motivation? Yeah. So what do you actually want to do? Um, and then the quote that really resonates with what you just shared, Brittany, comes at mm -hmm. the end of page 91 and it says, most American schools marinate students in behaviorism. So the result, unsurprisingly, is that children's intrinsic motivation drains away. They typically become more and more extrinsically oriented as they get mm -hmm. older and progress through elementary school. For us to turn around and say to of those students who are particularly dependent on extrinsic motivators that this is just their motivational orientation or learning style, something to which we must reconcile ourselves and to learn, we have to respond by providing more rewards. Seems unsatisfying, to say the least. And I'd like to highlight that behaviorism isn't a learning style. Mm -hmm. It's a way to get. It's a way to get students to comply, mm -hmm. to behave. Like a learning style is how do you absorb information and what do you do with that information, right? Like, if anything, rewards just are the antith antithesis and how do I say antithesis. that? Antithesis. Antithesis of, yeah, of learning style. Yeah, true. Um, so then last couple of things would be, well, if you still are like, well, I want to use rewards and I want to keep them going, <laughs> which I feel like, I don't know if <laughs> you're listening to our podcast I know. every week. I feel like that's getting weaker and weaker. Yeah. Like, like you're holding up a flag that says rewards and you're like, <laughs> oh, oh, lower. Yeah. I can make a comic strip of that at the end. Getting of the real story. heavy. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> um, so then this is the advice from Alpine. Make them as private as possible. So if you're going to reward the kid, do it on the DL. Give them after the fact. Mm -hmm. Have no contest for getting the award or reward. Make them as similar as possible to the tasks. Like if the kid reads a book, give them another book. Yes. And give them as much choice as possible about how they earn. 
and then immunize against the motivation killing effects that rewards have. So like tell kids about what happens and try to prepare them for that. Or just don't do it. <laughs> or, yeah. yeah. So I want to actually read this quote real quick. Mm -hmm. Um where he's talking about try to immunize, immunize individuals against the motivation killing effects of rewards. Uh, it's, it's talking about laboratory experiments. So some laboratory experiments have countered these effects by convincing people that they find the task interesting, which that's weird. And I don't know why I highlighted it, but this, this next part is good. Reminding them that they used to be interested in it or training them to focus on what is intrinsically motivating mm -hmm. about it. So you're not emphasizing the reward. You're emphasizing the student's enjoyment or curiosity or creativity, mm -hmm. which really, really is important because we don't want to be killing motivation to learn. Exactly. Like that's, I think that's what needs to be emphasized. Like we're not talking about motivation to lose weight. We're not talking about motivation to quit smoking. We are to we're talking about motivation to learn. Or to be a kind citizen. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Because that's what I feel like a lot of these systems are. It's for behavior management, right? So right. it's about, like, how to be respectful, how to be kind. Mm -hmm. How to be cooperative. Yeah, citizenship. Mm -hmm. I, every, it all makes sense. Like, when you learn mm -hmm. about all of this research, then you see the landscape we have, <laughs> which connects perfectly to yeah. the last two bombs that were dropped at the end of the oh, chapter the mental health yeah yeah so and then the awards and banquets i know that we're going to get more into rewards and school and grades and all of that stuff mm -hmm. in the upcoming chapters but it was mentioned that how schools should turn away from using awards and assemblies so the mm -hmm. quote i'm thinking of comes from page 93 and it says more important, it turns, it turns students into rivals, creating an atmosphere of hostility and sabotaging the possibility of cooperation that leads to higher quality learning. Finally, in an organization or school that cares about excellence, there is no place for awards, assemblies, or banquets. These might be defined as public events that instantly transform most of the people present to losers. Either people do not take them seriously, in which case there is no reason for them to exist, or people do take them seriously, meaning that watching someone else get an award is a powerful demotivator, in which case, again, there is no reason for them to exist. Yeah. I think as a kid who had severe ADHD, I knew that I was never going to get the reward. Mm -hmm. At that time, I didn't know it was my ADHD. I just thought I was stupid. But I knew. I wasn't going to get it. Yeah. So I was like, okay. F everybody. I'm cutting up and I'm ruining this whole thing. Because I was I was pissed because it wasn't fair. Yeah. And that explains what you see too. Because I feel like it's always chaos management at assemblies yeah. like that. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, and my question for you is how do you feel about awards for like everybody in your class for different things? Like, like the end of the year award ceremony. Not even like or? necessarily end of the year, like halfway through the year at the quarter mark or something. We don't give awards mm -hmm. at the quarter, um, because we are center based. Mm -hmm. We we don't emphasize grades. We can't. Yeah. Like we emphasize social emotional learning, um, and coping. Mm -hmm. and regulation which that's the goal of our kids our kids are um there to learn how to act learn how to act responsibly in their general ed setting so we're going to transition them back their grades are the last thing that yeah. they or anyone else is focused on and a lot of our kids have severe dyslexia um which you see a lot because I think it was, it's not um, this book, it's Daniel Sobel's um, The Inclusive Classroom, mm -hmm. talks about the um, correlation between um, uh, like dyslexia 
in language processing yep. and incarceration. And if you look at it, if you look at like a prison, almost 95% of those people can't read. It's staggering. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I did research on that last year. It's. Yeah. <laughs> because they don't have the skills to succeed in like, and with, oh God, it kills me with how much technology we have. There should be no reason a person who's dyslexic can't be on level, you know, ground with someone who's mm -hmm. not. If we're sending like people, if Elon Musk can go to the moon, right, mm -hmm. or space, like my eighth grader with dyslexia, sh that his, shouldn't be holding them back. Yeah. Oh. Yeah. That's my soapbox. Uh, uh, I'm right with you on that soapbox. Yeah. Right? <laughs> so then the last bomb to talk about is the mental health connection now. So let me find the quote about this. Oh. Okay, I found it. Page okay. 95. So our sense of ourselves as basically competent and worthwhile of being able to have an impact on the events that shape our lives, in short, our mental health, is in jeopardy when extrinsic motivation displaces intrinsic. Recent research corroborates this by indicating that extrinsically oriented people, presumably as a result of having been subjected to extrinsic environments, tend to be more depressed and to feel more helpless than intrinsically oriented people. When things aren't going well, their reaction gets even worse. Helplessness is an under understandable reaction, given that someone else is in a position to decide whether or not we get the reward for which we have been working. Yeah, that's, I would say that's what I was experiencing as a kid with severe ADHD when I'd go to those award ceremonies. I felt like it was completely out of my control and it wasn't fair. And that's why I cut up. Mm -hmm. And it did impact my mental health. It impacts, yeah. Yeah. And you see it play out in kids. Like you see the turmoil like on their faces. I know. It's really sad. Yeah. So I feel like that was a big bomb to drop in like the second to last paragraph of the chapter. But I think that we're probably going to be getting into it more as the book continues. Oh, it's the next um, the next chapter is the praise problem, mm -hmm. which like watching his workshops, this really gets me because I have a daughter. Right. And she's a toddler. And I feel like you praise everything mm -hmm. like good job not falling. Like, good job watching your feet. And I've stopped saying good job. But it's so natural. Yeah. Yep. So mm -hmm. that'll be a fun chapter to yeah. dive into. But what would you say then your action tip would be for teachers or caregivers after reading this chapter, Britt? Um, I want to say I'm on a big kick of like we need to abolish grades. Mm -hmm. So I think that – Education reform is absolutely necessary, right? Everybody, I think everybody agrees. And we need to start organizing around these principles that's like in this chapter where we're really killing kids' intrinsic motivation to learn and to be, you know, good citizens. Um, I think the biggest impactor of killing kids' motivation to learn are grades and they're unnecessary up until like eighth grade when you have to have grades for high school because it's preparing you for higher ed, right? You don't need grades in kindergarten or first grade or second grade or third grade. Like you don't need kid grades in elementary school. And I think we need to get rid of them. So let's organize around that. All right. Love that takeaway, Britt. <laughs> yeah. And then my takeaway would be to not underestimate the student. So whether that be their creativity, what they're capable of, their competency, how much autonomy they can handle, how much intrinsic motivation they have, don't underestimate. Instead, if you're unsure, ask questions and get to the root of what's going on. Kind of like Brittany did with that, the students who want to PBIS back, get to the root of what's happening and don't underestimate. Yes. That would be yeah. my takeaway. So that's today's episode then. 
All right. All I right. like it. I just realized I never hit go live on my Instagram. Brittany. <laughs> <laughs> asked you <laughs> i know the words came out of my mouth girl <laughs> i thought i did um are you live on instagram yeah i'm live on youtube well at least one of us got out there i'll have to tag you so people can see yeah <laughs> on your wow. profile too that's so funny man uh, look i'm watching our reaction right now i'm watching your reaction on my instagram that never <laughs> went live <laughs> It's oh, terrible. Okay. Okay. Uh, sorry about that. My AI is going to work on that. No, no, no. That, I think it's funny. Oh, it's endearing. Man. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that is another episode of Ignited. <laughs> we. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> That's really funny. Uh, well, we hope we left you feeling remoralized, re energized. And until next time, have a great week. Bye. Bye.